All right. Well, we are live on the air for what I'm sure is going to be a highly uh, high quality production of our uh, joint Microsoft technology success. We're five minutes away from a real start, right, Vanessa? So we are. Yes. Yeah. So, Everyone uh, has some time to settle in. Yeah, and our presentation crew is still joining in uh, as we speak um, from their houses in safe social distance quarantine mode or maybe the real office if you're the only one there. So we're going to get going. Bruce and I are going to kick it off here in about four minutes or so um, talking about change in the theory of constraints. After that, we're going to have Michelle and I doing, Gilbert and I doing Teams, and we'll have little breaks in between the sessions, right? How long are we having? Uh, we have a 10 minute break um, after the, the team session. Right. And then we'll hop back in with Power BI after that. And again, uh, we shifted the real event to, to this uh, format um, after, uh, well, I don't know, the world changed. So, mm -hmm. so we're, uh, we are actually, I am, I am both your uh, technology center director, one of the speakers, and the actual live event producer. Normally we'd have someone else doing all of that, but now it's Vanessa and Doug, right? I mean, really. And we are not anywhere physically near each other except for the internet. So we should probably do uh, an episode, at least on my show, of how we made this thing, this uh, little crazy event, because it's been pretty skunk works. Um, so yeah. anyway, we'll get going in, in two or three minutes. We just didn't want people to not have anything on the air. Uh, and I'm sure this is exciting banter for you all. There is a <laughs> Q&A panel. You want to talk about that and uh, how we're going to handle that today? Yeah, so I'll kind of uh, kick off the event. So first, thank you for joining us for our first ever virtual live event. Uh, as Doug mentioned, we're just uh, crossing our fingers here. We're all learning uh, new technology during these times. So we're hoping for a good event today. Um, we're honored to have a strategic partnership with Doug Splinter and the Microsoft Technology Center who will be presenting the sessions today. So the MTC actually usually only works with enterprise businesses and Success is one of the only small business partners that have access to Doug and these experts at the MTC. So on that note, we're also excited to announce that we'll be hosting quarterly virtual events like this to further enable your 365 practice. So stay tuned for those dates. I wanted to touch base on how we'll be doing a prize giveaway today. So. If you've been to our events in the past, you know that we like to give away prizes to attendees. So in the spirit of supporting small businesses during this time and in partnership with um, Lenovo, we're giving all participants to a, a $25 gift card to either Butcher and the Boar or the Parasoli Group. So these are two of our clients that have restaurants in the local Minneapolis area that are suffering during this time. So we're hoping to, to give them some help and then also give you guys a chance to go out to eat once, once that becomes like a thing. That. That's cool. That's yeah. really cool. Yeah, yeah, that's For sure. Cool. Um, yep. I've been trying to avoid so, the national the chain stuff. So what else you got? Yep. <laughs> um, the plan for the morning, Doug Splinter and Bruce Locke of Success will kick things off. Then we'll hand it off to Michelle Gilbert with the Microsoft Technology Center who will review Microsoft Teams. And then Valerie Bergman, also with the Microsoft Technology Center, will review Power BI which leads me to finally how we'll address questions throughout the event. So you'll notice on the right hand side you see a Q&A panel. It has a little question mark with some chat boxes. So if you click that you have the option to submit a question. So during the presentation you can submit questions as the presenters are demoing the applications. However, if we don't and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can during that time. But if we don't get to it, the last 10 minutes of both sessions will be dedicated to Q&A. So that is how we'll be doing questions throughout the event. Yeah, and you're going to be moderating. You're going to be moderating Q&A for us, right? And at the end, yep. um, there's a feedback link. So we'll show this again. Um, do remember, since it's a bit.ly link, they are case sensitive. So if you were to not do the upper cases that you see on screen, you'll maybe get somebody else's survey page. And I'm sure they welcome <laughs> your feedback, but we would prefer it more uh, to come our way. All right, so I'm going to do a little cut over here, and I'm hopefully going to bring uh, Bruce on with me. So um, I think there we go. So we got Bruce on with myself, yes. And then uh, we're going to cut over to a little bit of content between uh, Bruce and I because we're spot on, I think, aren't we at nine o'clock? We are. 
I don't know that we always start on time when we do these events physically, Bruce, when we're not at the convention center and stuff, but we <laughs> did it right. today, digitally speaking. It's uh, it's 9.01 a.m. Uh, and and we're, uh, we're ready to go. All right. And uh, uh, Vanessa, I see Val's in the lobby, so if we could cue her in uh, and we're on the air. All right. So like I said, we're not trying to be overly produced here today. Uh, and we are uh, we're live and on the air. All right. What we have going on this morning is Bruce and I were talking. I, I did this presentation last um, what was it fall um, for for the event, and I did a presentation on digital transformation and the importance of change and change management. And we were talking through what we want to do for a little kickoff for this event because we see a lot of organizations try and do things. And digital transformation is a big topic, but what does it really mean? And I liked your presentation on theory of constraints which I'm not going to do justice to, so that's why you're here in order to, to do that part of things. But what I really wanted to do was talk about the mashup of these two things. And that's kind of our goal, right? Is talk about theory of constraints. And when you've picked one of these things to work on, then how should you go about approaching getting that change actionable through your organization? Why don't we kick it off as a little joint discussion around the concepts behind digital transformation, this puffy concept. And I think your theory of constraints gives some actionability to that, which is why I, I love it so much. And as you look on screen, you can all read. So I'm not going to read stats off the slides because I'm pretty sure everybody can read things. But it, essentially, people say, hey, you have to change things because you're either looking to improve your business, you're, you're worried about irrelevancy. And I think right now, given the disruption that's happening in market, it's even more important, those kind of, you know, facets of what we're talking about. But then there's also a lot of people who say, hey, you only have a limited run of time before competition gets you. But then how do you pick if that's the thing? All right, well, I know I have to do things differently. What do I tackle? And you and I both believe these things are a journey. And it's not some singular moment. And the constraints thing, you want to talk about how generally speaking, the theory of constraints and how it kind of applies to this, like what it is philosophically. Sure. Theory of constraints uh, recognizes that in any system or process, you don't have unlimited capacity to meet demand that somewhere in that system there's a singular bottleneck or constraint that determines the flow of that value to meet the demand. And it's a body of knowledge that helps you understand how to best manage around that constraint to maximize yeah. both profit and top line growth. So if we map that to digital transformation, we both agree it's a journey. You're going to continually work through things. There's not like this moment like I have digitally transformed or I, all constraints are removed because in theory, there'll always be one you can go work on. Right. That's exactly right. In fact, the subtitle to the, the where Theory of Constraints started with uh, Eli Goldratt and the goal is the subtitle is, a, you know, continuous improvement. Literally, it's a journey of continuous improvement. It never Yeah, happens. I mean, and there's other frameworks for it. Kaizen for continuous improvement. There's other ones, too. I just I happen to like how this one is I don't know, more comprehensible some, than some of the other ones for like actionable. Hey, speaking of actionable. This is the whole point that we decided we would have for our thing, right? To decide what might have an impact, Bruce's portion of the universe, right? Like what things should you be focusing on? <laughs> focusing on? And then my part, which is, all right, we've decided, how the heck do we get there? You can't ignore either half of that equation. You might be effectively working on ineffective element or have chosen the right thing and not done a good job of getting it out. Exactly. I mean, I, and that's why I, I, I jokingly said this is the Reese's peanut butter cup conversation, right? Because <laughs> someone has got chocolate, someone's got peanut butter. You smash these things together. Now, I'm one of those rare people who doesn't like peanut butter and chocolate together. But if you do, right, this kind of thing could be could be highly effective and useful uh, for where you go. So now I'm going to be slide guy for you, and you're going to talk us through theory of constraints. Right. So uh, when Doug and I talk about mashing these up, uh, I'm a whiteboard guy, so I naturally went to my tablet and started sketching it out, and I thought, ah, this this will work. So um, normally when I, I talk theory of constraints, and I've been doing this for, oh, since about 2004, working with a variety of small businesses, I typically talk to one of the first two bullets. Um, the first is identifying the constraint and trying to maximize the flow of, of the system or looking at the, the implications from a profitability and growth standpoint, because um, leveraging theory of constraints really has a dynamic impact on, on both the top line and the bottom line. For example, I've, I've been with Success now for seven years, and our top line has grown by two and a half times, but our bottom line has grown by nine times, actually more than nine times. So it's a pretty effective body of knowledge on, on how to operate any type of business. So as depicted in the, the next slide, 
Um, I usually don't talk about this aspect of it. It kind of comes along with the other conversations, but it's really identifying what to change. And I've never really created a, a presentation around that. So you're going to see my sketches as, as shown in this next slide. As you and I um, both know, that that's my favorite kind is like the whiteboarding of things. Like we're both a little twitchy not having our whiteboards in front of us. We'll maybe try live yeah. with Penn next time. But for this that's time, right. he, uh, Bruce yeah. was kind enough to convert his whiteboards into slides for me so we can walk through this with you. But fire away. So, so, so this is my bad rendition of a, of a simple process. Five steps. They're dependent upon one another. It could be a project. It could be, uh, you know, underwriting a loan. It could be a, a case in a law firm. It just, it's just how work gets done. And this is my, as it's shown in the next slide, this is kind of my attempt to show that somewhere in the system we have a constraint. Uh, and I did it by just having less capacity as shown in that, that middle box. And then, of course, um, showing, uh, you, know, you know, here Xing out the, the black lines in steps four and five. Um, those capacities really no longer matter because steps uh, four and five are dependent on whatever gets passed by that middle constraint. So as shown in the next slide, um, literally the constraint determines the flow of whatever value you're, you're bringing to meet the demand in whatever marketplace you're competing in. And because it determines flow, it actually determines your revenue. Nothing else in this system will do that for you. And, and recognizing that is incredibly important. So you can organize your, your operations around that. So, but our conversation is around change. So on the next slide, I'm trying to depict that. So I just arbitrarily picked the first step in the process. It could be a step, it could be a department, it could be a machine. But I'm let's say I'm heading up that department and I want to go faster. So in the next slide, I basically show how I've increased my capacity. I've tried to double it here and using cost accounting, therefore my unit cost is in half and I'm getting rewarded for that. I'm, I'm really excited. I've brought some efficiency to this step, to this department I run, but here's the challenge. So in the next slide, I'm, I'm replacing that black line depicting flow with the green line. I can now depict it faster, but of course, now I run into the constraint of the next step, which is a black flow. And then ultimately I hit the constraint, which is the red flow. So ultimately, as shown in the next line, I don't change anything. And in fact, I, if I keep running, I'm gonna build up a pile of work, work in process that uh, unfortunately doesn't increase flow, but it increases my cycle time because my next unit of work that comes into the system not only has to go through the five steps, but it has to get through the pile of work. So here's a change that I thought was impactful to my system, but in fact, it had no impact on the flow, which means it had no impact on my revenues. And ultimately, however, and if you show the next slide, it did. It likely had an impact on cost. And if I let the work pile up, it also had an impact on uh, work in process, which means I'm investing my capital unwisely and therefore my profit goes down and my cash gets consumed. So, so here's a seemingly good thing to change. I'm the department head, I cut my unit costs in half, yet I had a negative impact on the company as a whole. So um, theory constraints really is a lens that helps you determine what to change and where and why, and even the priority in which order you should make those changes. So Doug, if you go to the, the next slide, it's really the combination of TOC and you know, it literally says change only that which improves the system. Don't sub-optimize and think a change in a department or step is actually a good change. Think through the entire system. And the best type is to increase the flow. More capacity with the same cost, that's productivity. And if you can't achieve that, then reduce cost to maintain flow and that's efficiency. But I'll tell you, Productivity wins out over efficiency every day. Unfortunately, we're usually taught to go after efficiency, but to be able to produce more with the same cost, if you can sell that excess capacity, man, the profit starts to go through the roof. And once you identify what to change, then I'll turn it over to Doug. You need a framework to execute that change so you can do it really, really well. And in combination, you can start accelerating the pace of productive change, which results in highly profitable growth. Which is kind of the goal, right? And, kind of. and the reason we we want, yeah, it is a goal, right? For a, for a business. Um, and, and this is where we come into, uh, and I want to put this in, con I, I had the same thing before. I was a former law firm IT director. And once did, I told you this story before, we did a business process visualization on new matter intake, simple thing, right? And it wasn't happening quick enough. 
that people are like, well, maybe we need more, you know, clerks involved in the process. But actually, it was an approval process run by the partners that was the constraint. When we actually analyzed it, we gained visibility over it, right? Which is kind of why we're having Power BI in here today. If you don't know what something is, if you don't have visibility as to what the process is, you know, by the step, and you don't have business reporting metrics around it, you won't know where the constraint is. Which is why I so love the the last presentation that we're doing um, with Val, which is that that theory of constraints thing. Do you have visibility, which we're working on later on? And if you're going to fix things with these cool collaboration tools that Michelle and I are going to show off and, and other things, then um, then we want to make sure the stuff we're fixing is actually relevant according to the theory of constraints. Have you visualized what it is you're doing? And are you really making an impact? And that's the goal. That's it. Yeah. Um, see, it sounds so simple, doesn't it? it so then how do you, so how do you, <laughs> how do you, it were simple, everybody would do it, right? I, I wanted to point out, we've done this before, and this will be kind of small, but this is a, a value a, a mapping exercise. And you don't have to, you can just get a sense for the a whiteboard. And this is a, something we did with a customer. We brainstormed a whole bunch of areas and then like things they could go attempt, if you will. We call them high value use cases. So if you're thinking about leveraging teams, what well, the attempt is just to brainstorm an entire list of things that you could do better, right? For collaboration or project management and stuff. And then we're mapping them both on difficulty and impact. Now the difficulty scale is gonna involve cost, people transformation, some other things we're gonna talk about on top of that, right? Um, and But the impact is really where, that's the subjective thing that you should be mapping, in my opinion, against the theory of constraints, right? That's exactly because right. The, I can, like my organization of architects, you're going to meet Valerie, you're going to talk to uh, Michelle from the specialist team today and myself on some team stuff, and we're going to be all geeky about it. And we get very excited about our technology, but the real value of any technology is always expressed in terms of business impact. And so what we want to do is make sure if you're looking at Teams or something else, obviously right now, when you sent everyone home and you started using Teams, you're going to have the out-of-the-box value proposition. You, We were a pre-built constraint remover. You couldn't collaborate, and, and now you can, right? Like that's a that's a very different um, uh, that's a very different portion of things. But we want to make sure that once you get past those emergency fires, that your next investments are more thoughtful around constraints that are gonna have a positive impact to your business. Obviously, when everybody went home, it was get internet connectivity, get PCs and compute devices, <laughs> get headphones. You know, there were all these. Those were the urgent constraints against the work from home scenario to continue doing business. But now we got to go after the other things. And, and I think that's where the long-term value in technology is continually applied. Not that first easy fruit plucking, but the other ones that strategically impact that constraint flow. And that's really what I'm trying to make sure that we focus on. So Microsoft has partnered with ProSci and we use a framework you referenced called the ADCAR framework. And what we want to do is go ahead and, and think about the change we want to introduce as more of a structured process. And the ADCAR framework from ProSci says, all right, you've brainstormed this list, you've picked one. Now you're going to have to go through a framework of getting change out there. And the one thing I want to point out to people is the worst thing you can do is get partial change across parts of your organization, because then you're really only increasing complexity of your organization. You're not actually achieving a positive change outcome. Now there's always going to be some people who won't want to change, right? But if you, if you don't, it's like when I, we take people, we start migrating their data to the cloud. If they never get rid of their on-prem assets, if there's no cloud advantage to collaboration or productivity, you've actually increased your complexity and you haven't really gained anything. In order to get change going through the organization, what do you really need? You need an awareness of the change you want to make, right? So I have to tell you, Bruce, this is the change and everyone needs to understand what that change is. Step one, if you're not aware of the change we're asking you to do, then nothing else matters because you're not aware. Now, I would like to point out, there's a lot of thing about awareness as to how many of you get emails you don't read. So simply sending an organization-wide email announcing a change is not a change, okay? So that's not enough. Maybe it is if you're a small company. You get beyond like 20 or 30 people, and, and then there's the next one, which is the desire to change. Desire is driven a lot by how do you feel about that change, right? What is your emotional response to it? Are you a person who likes change at all? Is your job already full? Is your plate full? And I'm asking you to do more, right? Um, like why, why do I need to do this? So my the awareness of the change that's needed, the desire to support the change, the knowledge of how to change. So Bruce, I would like you to start doing online meetings and work from home. I don't know how to use Teams. I don't know how to do this. I'm all in from continuing to remain gainfully employed. So I, I have an awareness and a desire, but maybe I don't have the knowledge to do it effectively. I'm not comfortable scheduling online uh, meetings and all that stuff. 
then once you did the uh, once you have the knowledge, then you have to have the ability. Man, I now know it, but maybe I'm not good enough uh, in order to to make the change happen. And and that's the next step in it is that if you don't have the actual ability to do it, and people frequently think that giving someone the knowledge gives them the ability. And I would like to point out that's a huge leap for a lot of people. Some people are going to be really good at certain kinds of things. Some people are going to be good at others. And one of the things we focus on in Microsoft is Microsoft has tiers of management, like a lot of companies do. And we always say that change is best received from the highest level of the organization, the, you know, or your immediate manager. Everyone in the middle seems kind of fuzzy. Does that make sense to you? I mean, Bruce, what do you think of that? Does that resonate? Uh, absolutely. So let me go back to something you said earlier about, you know, don't do partial change to the organization. It just makes it more complex. So yeah. uh, last summer, um, we may be unique in our industry. We, we created a product manager position to help us bring new services to market. And, um, you know, that may be one of the most complex things you can do, right? A new product or service involves the entire organization from marketing to sales to delivery to the back office. And, and that's hard for small companies to do. And you mentioned you gave this presentation at our fall classic. And we immediately adopted ADCAR as part of our bringing new offerings to market. And, it, and it's had a big influence because, again, you bring a new service to market, it involves the entire organization. And to synchronize that and you know come to market at the same time across the board and deliver a good product and a good experience, that's really hard. And, you know, again, you can identify what to change, but executing is really hard. And this framework has really been helpful for us. So um, I'm, I'm a big, big advocate for it. So then the last one is perhaps the, let's say you go through, I made you aware of the change. I got you to agree that it's a good thing, right? I trained you on how to use Teams. I mean, let's be honest, this morning we were prepping for this live event and you were trying to get the confidence view up and going. How did that go? Uh, not we well. Didn't, it did not go well. So <laughs> we haven't practiced enough. So now your ability to do this, you're like, well, okay, I'm comfortable with this part, but that part I need more knowledge, right, on top of it. Do you have a secondary monitor? Do you have the ability to do that? You know, those kind of things. Do you have a quiet enough environment? Is your internet reliable enough as we watch our, our event bump a little bit on pauses? Like, these are the actual things that you need to know uh, about where you're at. So do I have the ability to do that, to demonstrate those skills and behaviors? And those, those constraints can be very different as an individual, right? Uh, applying the theory of constraints to your own personal life is always fascinating. Don't do it. It's very frustrating. Uh, you'd be like, you know, I should spend my life according to these process flows, right? Um, we have this whole methodology in the MTCs around discovery and and uh, how to handle uh, issue resolution and all sorts of stuff. And my family will occasionally say, stop MTCing me, right? So it's like, stop change managing to me. Right, fair enough. Um, the last one, the R, the reinforcement. Then we have to have an ongoing. It's not, in fact, it's not a master move that we talked about in the cold open. It's not some kind of journey. I mean, it's not, it's not a single move, it's a journey. So we have to have ongoing reinforcements to say, you did it, you did it once. Now we want you to keep doing that. Otherwise, we've essentially put the constraint back in place if we can't sustain the change, right? So, so that's very yeah. important um, on top of it. Okay, so we have a, a tactical example that we wanted to walk through. So if we were to think about, we've gone through a constraint exercise and, and we've identified things that are the constraints. So we want you to stop doing these things. This is a classic kind of Office 365 style Teams example. In order to increase effective collaboration, we would like you to stop sharing, sharing documents and follow-ups from meetings via email and using paper notebooks. We would like you to collaborate on documents and team sites and use OneNote and these things, right? Like for leadership, we want you to stop sending organizational status updates via email and we want you to start sharing things via SharePoint News. Right. What we're doing here is this is about a, a digital transformation initiative that potentially essentially allows you to have that we're identifying the action ability at different levels of the organization. Who's going to do what to reinforce and sponsor that change across the organization? And so the knowledge workers, here's what we're asking you to do. Leadership, we're asking you to do this, right? The different roles in the organization, here's what we're asking you to do in order to initiate that change. And then you actually have to go back through the ADCAR framework for each one of those things and say, how do I make sure all those people in the chain are equipped in order to do it? When you do that, in, from our experience, it's going to cause a couple of things. First, it's going to make you work on fewer things, <laughs> right? You're going to pick fewer things and you're going to try and do them well, right? Thoroughly and successfully and identify what you can do. And if you fail at it, then you kind of got to go back to the drawing board of how am I going to get these activities done? Or maybe it doesn't have the value you think you had. So you, you misalign the value or impact. 
which is why I don't think you should work on something that's not aligned to your theory of constraints that we opened with. Kind of bring this back, <laughs> back around right. full circle. Because if, and, and this is why I say leadership has to sponsor these things, because if I pick it from IT and I say, this is best for you all, it's just another one of those messages that, that you know, well, they're just trying to make me use the tech they bought or something along those lines. And that's really not what any of this is supposed to be about. I mean, it isn't. It's supposed to be about having an impact on your business. If you look at Microsoft's mission statement, right, it's to empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. Nowhere in there does it say people need to use, create more Word documents. They need to, like, have more Teams meetings. You know, these things are done in the pursuit of something, an impact to your business. So sometimes you buy like an accounting package because you know it's it's impact to your business. It's gonna allow you to run a general ledger according to Gap, right? <laughs> like you just need certain things to happen so your you know CPA can do the work for your business. When it comes to technology, the applications are so broad that it is super easy. I mean, crazy easy to start working into your terms on one of those green bucket items and pooling a bunch of activities around something that doesn't really matter to your business. Uh, as you said, swing back to theory constraints. Make sure it affects your system. Um, you know, Doug, we you, you mentioned uh, uh, the mission. It's not about technology. Um, when we think about serving our clients, uh, we use a simple mantra, if you will. Business is hard. IT is hard. Our job is to make IT easier so that our clients can pursue their mission. They're not in the business of IT. They're not in the business of teams. They're not in the business of Google. They're in the business of delivering some value, whether it's mental health services or it's construction. It doesn't matter. They're in business for their mission. Our job is to support that mission and using tools and frameworks like Theory of Constraint and ADCAR will help them in their change journey because we can't, none of us can stand still. As you said, the world's changing. We have to transform. Our competitors are doing it. We need to do it. And to have a framework that we can be confident in, that the changes we invest in are having a material impact on our ability to deliver is critical. In fact, if you do this well, it, in, in most cases, it will set you apart from your competitors. All right. Well, I don't know if that's how you expected a cold open for a Microsoft uh, tips and tricks for Teams and BI and stuff to go. But as we show you this software, we really did want people to say, do it with a purpose, aligned around something. And I think these two frameworks fit very well together. We have links in the follow on if we do more. We got a couple minutes for Q&A. Uh, Vanessa, do we have any Q&A from people or anything that came in? We do. Um, we have someone asking, where does buy-in have a place in the ad car model? At least from my perspective, theory of constraints, the buy-in will, will demonstrate value in terms of uh, probably three areas. One is the flow, you know, the ability to deliver more on your mission. The other then translates either into growth on the, the top line or obviously uh, the bottom line. So I think using that lens will um, it'll literally talk in terms of an owner, or a, you know, a senior manager in terms of how they would measure success. And buy-in happens at multiple levels, but you do need that. Like inside of Microsoft, our, I don't know if you, if anyone's ever had not, if you had a chance to read it, um, Satya Nadella did his book, uh, Hit Refresh, and he titled it because Refresh uh, in a browser, because he's an engineer mindset, selectively returns that which needs to be updated. And, and that was why his metaphor for it was, because the original definition of Refresh in a browser was to selectively update that which is out of date and, and needs updating. And he looked around Microsoft, and there was this cartoon that said all the engineering groups were in armed foxholes pointing against each other and uh and he's like that that's not the microsoft i join that's not what i want culturally and so we went through this giant cultural transformation inside of microsoft where at leadership level it became about collaboration how we rewarded people changed for have you leveraged the work of others contributed and how, what have you done as an individual so the three pillars of microsoft success for a given employee in our organization we've been very public about this is what have you done what have you leveraged from others and what have you contributed to the work of others? And all three pillars are viewed equally inside of Microsoft, which requires you to balance your thinking around the contributions, the ability to help people, to do your own great work and to look at the work around you and see how you can accelerate it as part of your contributions. That, that's a whole different mindset than, than seven years ago. Do you know what I mean? Like, and, and then we had to get on board. One of the, the things they talk about in HR if you join the company is they're like, we're not about if you want to be cool, you can work somewhere else. If you want to make other people cool, join Microsoft. So, so it's not, so someone's like, you know, you don't, you guys don't have this or that sizzle or whatever. Like, we're not concerned about that. We also believe that 
that revenue is a lagging indicator of the success of our work, right? That our Wall Street success is, you can't sit around and wait on that. You have to be out executing and then eventually they figure out what you've done and decide to give you credit or not um, for the work that you've done. And so, so culturally, I think that's an important, what is your company's value and how is it expressed to your employees and the culture you preserve? That's a really big deal. All right, any other questions for us as we kind of get ready to transition away? Uh, one last question. So as an organization, um, we are deeply committed to traction. How does this relate to the concepts described in traction? Can either of you speak on that? Traction is related to the entrepreneurial operating system. And the way I like to describe that is not unlike a computer, right? The operating system provides discipline in the background to allow you to use the computer. So uh, in one sense, EOS and traction is a discipline uh, methodology. It keeps you on track. It keeps you on the same page but it's not the content. Attraction doesn't deliver the content. That's your culture, as Doug says, that's, that's your mission. And these other frameworks, theory, constraints, and ADCAR are how you go about executing that. So strategy, they, they, they go right together. Strategy to the bridge between strategy and tactics, the, the work breakdown and its, its prioritization, and then the actionability of getting that change done through the organization. Top, middle, execution. If you get all those things together, and boy, it's so easy. Um, you just wave a magic wand and you, you go about doing it. <laughs> and it works.